Hey. My name is Chris Romeo. I'm the global chair here of the first ever Threat Mod Con. And so I just want to tell you how excited I am that, we, that this event has come together in such a way. And I'm excited that each and every one of you is here. Um, you think about how much threat modeling knowledge and experience we have in the world. And I think 95% of it's probably in this room right now. So super excited to have all of you here. Yeah, come on. And so as I said, this is the first and only threat modeling conference. Like I've been doing security for 26 years and I can't remember there ever being a threat modeling conference before. So we're really, we're, we're, we're breaking some new ground here with this, this threat modeling con. And so Threat Modeling Connect is really the, the, or the group, the community that's behind this. So how many people are members of Threat Modeling Connect right now? Show of hands. I knew I was going to get almost 100%. If you're not, you certainly can uh, become a member. There's some, it's, it doesn't cost you anything, but it's a, it's a community of excellence of threat modeling people, all getting together, sharing opinions, sharing knowledge, and whatnot. So um, we couldn't do this without our sponsors. Okay, so uh, from, you know, Arius Risk, Torian, Now Secure, Trust on Cloud, Armor Code, Purple Book Community, thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting us through this process. Like, we needed, we needed your support to make this a reality, and so we're super excited that uh, you were willing to partner with us in this process. Let's talk just for a second about our agenda as far as what we're going to do here. Um, so we're in our opening remarks right now, and then from there we'll go into our keynote which is definitely a treat that uh, has been set up for you. Um, and then from there, we're going to go into talk one, talk two, talk three, and then we'll go into lunch. Just know that there's two different tracks happening here. So this is the UDC room, and then the, the room next door is Catholic University. And so there are, there's two tracks, and there's two talks happening at each time after the keynote wraps up. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is we have two excellent workshops that are running after we eat lunch today from 1.30 to 3. And so I'd recommend that you be in one of those workshops. Um, you can see when you look at the agenda, you'll be able to see what, uh, what the workshops are. But we've got Robert and Jono who are teaching those, and it's going to be an excellent experience. Um, and then when we come in towards the end of the day, we've got talk four, talk five, and then some closing remarks. I'll come back up and share kind of a summary of what we saw happen today and, and talk a little bit about the future. Um, Everybody got a badge here. If, if you'll notice, some people have white badges. So white badges represent those that are uh, help to run the event. So if you have a question or you're trying to figure something out, find somebody that's got one of these white badges. They can either give you an answer or they can get you to somebody who can give you an answer. So just so you know as the day goes on here. Um, also on the back of the badge is this same code to get to the agenda for the day. So we decided not to print any agendas out. Um, we, it's, it's all in this online document for you, so uh, feel free to take a look at that. Um, so this is the group of people that put this event together. And you'll notice, uh, you know, this is, this is a, a group of people that we've been working on this for, I don't know, six, eight, nine months. And then, um, so you'll see a lot of these people here today. Feel free to talk to them, ask questions. Um, I also want to call out Shunning, who's standing in the back. Everybody turn around and look at Shunning. Shunning, raise your hand, please. <laughs> Shunning, I had Shunning on this slide, and she removed herself, so I had to uh, ensure that everybody knows who she is. So let me just very quickly share what I think of as my calls to action for you in this day that we have dedicated to threat modeling. Uh, so it really begins with this idea of learning. I want to encourage you, lean into the assembled sessions, the workshops that we have here. Like, this is an incredible program. Like, I'm excited to, I, I've been, Izar and I have been talking about, like, we can't wait for this event to happen because we want to sit in on, on these things. We want to hear these speakers. So we've got an excellent program put together for you here. I would say second, my call to action here is network with the crowds. Get to know some of the people that are here from a big scale. Visit our vendors out there that are set up with their tables. Uh, but just connect with other threat modeling people. And then the last one is really just connect with at least three new people. Like I would love everybody to leave this event saying, oh, you know what, I met these three people and I'm connected with them on LinkedIn now and, and I'm going to continue to encourage what they're doing from a threat modeling perspective and understand and, and, and kind of stay in touch. So um, yeah, that's, that's the, my call to action for you. 
Um, last thing I want to just mention is um, we are doing this uh, Share Now and Win contest by 5 p.m. today. Um, share something about ThreatModCon on social media, hashtag ThreatModCon, um, and then tag the, the TM Connect HQ. Um, or on LinkedIn, Threat Modeling Connect. We've got that nice photo wall out there. If you want to take a picture, um, you can put it on Instagram. I don't know what that means, but I've heard people say that. So um, <laughs> I'm supposed to say that, I think. I don't know really what that is. So um, with that, I am going to invite Matt Coles to come up here, and he is going to lead us into our keynote for this time. So please welcome Matt as he comes to the stage. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to ThreatModCon, this is awesome. Uh, as Chris said, white badges, come find us if you have any questions. Uh, so my role today is pretty simple. I'm here to introduce the members of our keynote. It's actually not a keynote, we're doing a not a keynote keynote. We're gonna talk about and we're gonna learn about threat modeling and the journey that everyone has had. Uh, and so I will kick it off with our first speaker, Brooke Schoenfeld, he is the elder elder AppSec statesman or diplomat, as he likes to call himself. He's a prolific author, uh, a teacher, a mentor, uh, and I'm sure he'll give us a wonderful intro into the world of threat modeling and how we got where we got. Thank you, Matt. So if they get the, if they get the mic on, hopefully, yeah? Is it on? Yeah, good, yeah, I hear it. It's bouncing off the back wall. Um, I thought it would be fun if we just took a little history tour. So I went to Ingram, Google's Ingram, which is, you know, millions of books on print, mostly in English, so I don't know about other languages. And I said, when does threat model show up in English? I thought, you know, like 1900, 1949 is the answer. 1949. I could not find that reference. So I don't know what, I don't know what that was. And one would assume it would be geopolitical and military, right? Well, by the mid-50s, people are using the term threat modeling all over the place. Retail. Artists. I'm not kidding. I, I read this stuff. Uh, social sciences. Threat modeling. Anthropology. All kinds of places. And engineering. And, of course, military and geopolitical. Duh. Threat modeling for computers, not mentioned at all. Nothing. That doesn't start showing up until much later. Does anybody take a guess when the first threat modeling program, sorry, Urius Risk and your competitors, first one shows up, US Department of Defense and Energy, the labs, 1984. It's explained in a paper in 1994. Yeah, 1984, first, first program. Um, so, you know, that was a pretty interesting tour. It really gets going in the mid-90s for computers. Really gets going. And uh, that really, our, our technique and everything starts to really get set with Bruce Schneier at all, and I don't have all of those people, but 1996. Okay, so that's, that's the, kind of a little quick tour, all right. I get started around 2000. I was already doing security when I thought I knew a lot, and then I got to Cisco and realized I knew nothing. Yeah, that was, that was serious change in my universe when I got in with people like Michelle Crabb or Michelle Gell and Steve Atchison and the like. But we, that was the days of central security going to teams and trying to make them behave. Those were bad days, I'll tell you. All about engagement and everything, and the many-gated security development life cycle. Anybody remember the many-gated security development life cycle, some of the folks around here? You know, there were so many gates, nobody could figure out what anything was. What's the difference between a security review and a security architecture review and a security checkpoint and a mm, 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 mm. So roll along, four or five programs I started to build, I built and then helped run, technically lead, and I get to Intel as their version of Distinguished Engineer, many years later, and 
they have this thing called a safe panel. They also had a many, at, at McAfee, which we were being integrated, we had uh, Agile, and, and everything was iterative, and it was very fast and, and, and very different. But at Intel, they still had the many gated. It was so many gates, I swear to you. We had to have a facilitator there who would remember the process, because none of us could remember where we were. But as I listened to what we were doing, we were all threat modeling at different levels, to be sure, at different levels. But we were always threat modeling in order to find the right answer. Does this thing need security engagement? Does this thing need you know, more? Can we go deeper? Whether it was a threat modeling session, whatever it was, we were always threat modeling. You could tell by the questions that were being asked and the things that people said. These are all really brilliant, very experienced people. And that changed my perspective. And I realized over time, threat modeling is fundamental to everything we do in information security. Everything. How can you tell what to invest in unless you know what threats you're trying to counter and how you're going to do it? And really, the other lesson was threat modeling really is for everyone. That's the only way it really, really works as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brooke, for that wonderful introduction to threat modeling and the world of threat modeling and how we got here. So now I'm happy to introduce John Taylor. So John is, he likes to say he, he's entered a lot of the field and done a lot of the work before there was a thing to enter. And so he'll tell us about his experience bringing into the world of threat modeling, coming from the outside in. Thanks, you, John. So good morning, everybody. Can you hear me OK? All right, excellent. So just to you know, kind of tell a story about where I you know, kind of entered into this field and how this kind of became a more permanent type of position. My first career, I was actually a motion picture editor. Los Angeles, California, worked for many of the big studios. And so what was kind of interesting about that is I became an architect without knowing that I was an architect. I was editing movies. And this was during a time where things were changing. At first, movies were shot on film. And then, of course, they were finished on film. There was no digital, analog, videotapes, you know, hard drive editing systems. It didn't exist. So. I found myself working with many organizations and groups, and what we were doing is we were changing, and it was a changing time in that industry that basically says, well, how do we do this electronically? There was this shift, this transition. So I was part of a group, and we were building, designing, creating new systems, new workflows, things to help make that whole transition work. So during that time, we were architecting systems. So if I think about this and I look back on that period of time, what was I doing? I was an architect. I was a solutions engineer. I designed things, right? And I, I didn't even know what that was. I, I've made movies for a living, right? So, uh, you know, I think about this now. This was sort of the start. And this was in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when this began for me. And so what would happen was, oh, well, I'm doing this work. And now I, I realize later. But where does security come into play? Where does threat modeling come into play? In the early 90s, piracy hit heavily within that industry. Intellectual property was being stolen. And it, used to be, and it used to be not so easy, because if you were on film, you would have literally five 2,000-foot reels that weighed a ton that consisted of a film. It wasn't portable. I couldn't take it somewhere and hide. Right? So here I am with all this stuff. Like, well, I'm just not going to pirate this. What do I do with it? Right? How do I make that happen? So as things transition from film to then working with electronic means, videotapes, eventually DVDs came about, digital editing systems, things became portable. When that happened, piracy started to reach and become a real big problem. So we decided, well, what do we do? How do we stop this from happening? And we thought to the, you know, ourselves, there was even some companies that came in to help develop frameworks but then I had to implement and design things as well while I was actually doing the work. And so we came up with things like access control. 
So I had to build access controls for various things using directory services, all that fun stuff that we know about, right? And then we had physical security systems. So I had to design a bunch of database vault systems. So here I am, once again, architecting, engineering, building things to support the business I worked in. So because of that, that time of piracy, it was in the early 90s, there was a huge bust. The FBI came in, raided a facility, a facility that I had actually done work with and used as a vendor because of that transition to that new format, that portability, which allowed people, and two gentlemen were arrested. Uh, they were selling versions of nearly finished films overseas to other international markets, illegally, mind you. So that protection then comes into place. Well, what did, what did we do about it? Like I just mentioned, database systems, all kinds of fun things that we started implementing. So there were controls, physical, administrative, technical controls. Little did we know at the time, and I didn't think about this, that was actually threat modeling. We would see like, oh, what's the potential threat? What could happen, right? Piracy, et cetera, that was kind of the main driver behind that. But I didn't really think about that as I was an editor, going, wow, is that threat modeling? I didn't even know what that was. I didn't even know what an architect was. I was an editor. So in fact, basically, here I am, and I think about this, and I look back. Wow, I was threat modeling before it was even kind of named. Uh, according to Brooke, there was actual documentation. There were situations where it was, but I didn't know that. I was so far removed from that space, it was like, uh, uh, oh, well, now I think about it now. I was doing that. So what I realized over time, as I began to continue and I transitioned my career to where I am today, that time spent as an architect and a threat modeler came into valuable, uh, as a valuable thing for me. Now, I threat model. I have a large program. You can talk to me later about what I do. Uh, but basically, what has then happened is by doing that in itself made me a better architect. And maybe think more about what it was that I was creating. You know, there's, there's the four question framework, et cetera, where uh, from Adam that talks about, you know, what could go wrong in my building, what could go wrong, what are we going to do about it, those things. And, and really, it made me think a lot more while I was building and designing solutions. So now it has this name. Now there's this momentum and movement behind it. And so here we are today, you know, like Chris mentioned earlier, we have how many people in this audience that are threat modeling? How did you get there? For me, it was kind of this weird transition to doing something I've always done, but it didn't have a name before. Not because it didn't exist, it's because, well, I didn't really think about what it was I was doing. I didn't realize what was going on. So for me, moving forward and becoming a better architect, looking at our threats, examining these things is now my day-to-day -day job, right? So this is what I do. What I've realized for me is that being a architect, solutions engineer, and all these different things, I got better and better. I thought about what I was doing. So today, when I talk to a lot of architects, solution engineers, and designers, they're actually, they didn't know they were doing it too. They didn't realize that that was what was happening in their careers. You had to start thinking about this stuff. Why? Because it was important and it was sort of the natural thing to do. It wasn't really, uh, oh, this rigid, regimented thing that we just had to add this process to what it is. Whereas now, <clears throat> you're already there. You're already doing this. So, it kind of, for me, this is where threat modeling came into light, right? This is where I was already exposed and didn't know it, but it's what I've become today. Thank you, Thank you John, for that wonderful story. Really appreciate it. So next up is Robert Herb Herbert. <laughs> I'm horrible with names. So Robert is a uh, dev, dev focused practitioner of threat modeling, and he's going to talk a little bit about introduction to threat modeling from a developer's aspect. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, I started uh, developing uh, many, many years ago. Uh, I first heard about thre uh, threat modeling around the early 2000s, but I was already a developer for about 10, 12 or so years at that time. And uh, at that time, we were building products, building systems, but we didn't think about security as much because it was handled by somebody else, 
right? We had firewalls, we had all kinds of other systems that were helping us with that, and we just assumed we're good to go until we weren't. <laughs> we started to find out, oh, there's some things we need to think about we haven't been thinking about. And so as I mentioned, I learned about threat modeling really around the early 2000s, and I was just captivated. I said, wow, I didn't know we could think this way. And I was already starting to architect. I was already still a developer. I did that for many, many years. But I found that once I learned about threat modeling, I started to share it with others and say, wow, this is a really interesting way of looking at the world and thinking about what we're doing. And I started uh, speaking about it and so forth. And then, I'm a, but I get back, well, yeah, that sounds interesting, but we don't have time for that. Anybody ever heard that before? <laughs> okay. We don't have time for that. We've got to get work done. We've got to get moving on. We've got to ship. We've got to just do all the things that we're doing. So then fast forward a few years. I'm still doing threat modeling wherever I was on, on contracts and so forth as a consultant. I was still doing threat modeling. But about 10 plus years later, I found that it was starting to get a little bit more interest. And I actually had somebody approach me and say, hey, I was in that thing, one of those things that you spoke about threat modeling way back when. Are you still doing that? I said, absolutely. And so then I started talking about it again. And as I went through in my career, I had opportunities to talk to other people about threat modeling. And so I have a few stories to share with you about some folks that I've met over the years. <coughs> uh, one was Linda. Linda was a uh, data manager at a bank that I worked at. We had built a program called Threat Modelers in Residence. It was a, a way of getting folks who are interested in threat modeling to help others learn about threat modeling. Um, it's similar to a security champion program that you may be familiar with today. So Linda uh, heard one of our um, talks on threat modeling, and we said, we've got this new program we're starting, and she said, I'd like to join, but I'm not technical. Can I join? I said, absolutely. And you know what? She became one of our best threat modelers. She was able to use some of her skills and apply and embrace threat modeling, and she did a fantastic job. And so I really, and she was one of our first ones, and she stayed through the entire program, which is fantastic. And so I was always glad to see that Linda took a chance and said, I don't really know if I can do this, but I want to try. And she did a great job. Another person was Rachel. Rachel was focused on risk and GRC, but she said, threat modeling sounds almost like what I'm doing. I'm interested in that. And so she joined our program as well, and again, became a fantastic threat modeler. Uh, she said it really helped what I was doing. I understood a lot more. And it just, and she's continued to do that as she's gone along. And then just last year, we had a person join my team at the consulting company I'm at, and that's Jono. And you're gonna be meeting him later today. But Jono had come back from, or come from a uh, DevOps uh, perspective, infrastructure manager perspective. And he said, uh, let me take a look at this threat modeling. He dug in, he said, you know what? I've already been doing this stuff. I just didn't know that's what it was called. And again, he's done a fantastic job as a threat modeler. And he and I are doing some of the workshops today. Um, I'm doing the beginner one. He's doing the one I know where a threat model is and now what do I do? So you know, definitely invite you to one of our uh, workshops. But this is what we're talking about. Anybody can do this. Anybody can learn about it and apply it. And I know in my own life, it certainly has made a difference and brought a lot of value to me personally, professionally, and I've seen that time and time again. I've got lots of other stories, uh, but I can't share with the, all of them with you today. But I just want to give you a few that, to say there are all kinds of opportunities to talk to people about threat modeling. And once they learn it, once they see it and apply it, it can change their lives as well. They start to see things differently, uh, which may be good or bad, some people say. But I think it's good because it really helps. And so I want to encourage you to do the same. As you go through, you say, I know about this threat modeling. It's a fantastic thing. Share it with somebody else. Help them embrace it just as we've done so that they can continue on to tell others about threat modeling and what it can do. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. All right, so next up we have Siba, I'm going to mangle this, Dealer Schneider. Did I get it right? Close? close. <laughs> Not even close. So Siba is a, is a leader in the threat modeling space, and he's going to talk a little bit about training and how training influenced threat modeling. 
Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, I really want to share with you the, the story how we got into uh, threat modeling training. Uh, we, uh, personally, I've already been doing application security for over 20 years. And then uh, with our company, we were doing a lot of threat modeling 10, 15 years ago. Um, and for, for our customers, uh, and we were thinking about, okay, how do we scale this up? How can we, uh, I would say, make sure that other people are also doing that in, in the sense of like, instead of feeding people, uh, like the, the Chinese proverb, teaching them how to fish. Uh, so the, how, how can we make sure that people really get better at this? And our customers also asked us uh, to do workshops and out of that grew a training. And we did our first uh, hands-on threat modeling training at, uh, at an OWASP conference in Italy, in, uh, in Rome in 2016, uh, which was really great. And, uh, and at that time, we also submitted our training for uh, Black Hat. Uh, the Black Hat trainings in uh, in Vegas, and that's the uh, I would say the the Champions League of trainings uh, um, here in here in, in here in the US. You probably call that the NFL, uh, but it's the it's 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 the top notch training. And uh, now there's a lot of submissions there, and and we got refused, so we did not get into into Black Hat. So that was a bummer. Um, and then one year later, uh, again uh, you have to submit your training at least like half a year before that, and. I don't really remember how we got uh, to our new name, uh, and we did not have ChatGPT at the time, uh, so no, uh, no help there. Uh, probably helped uh, that we drank a couple of like uh, Belgian beers, uh, but we we thought about like how can we make sure that we have Black Hat accept our training. So hacking has to be in there somewhere in that title. Uh, so we came up with the term whiteboard hacking. Uh, so we called our training whiteboard hacking and we called it advanced whiteboard hacking to have it up in the list of names obviously <laughs> um, but we we got accepted and and the and the funny thing about this is we only changed the title we only changed the title the, the the text the submission was literally the same of the year before um, but that that got us into into the training business for real uh, because since then we've been doing these trainings at, at all kinds of black hat OWASP O'Reilly and other conferences um, and so with that uh, we, we really I would say have more impact uh, on, on teaching people people on how to do this we've probably trained thousands of people to to do this um, but the, the big lessons learned here is that packaging training and packaging threat modeling is at least as important as doing it itself. Yeah, you have to convince people, product owners, organizations to start to do this. Uh, and then you have to translate what you're doing to their language and, and what they care about. So if you're going into a, I would say a DevOps team and you, talk, and you start about talking about cybersecurity risk, it doesn't land too well. Uh, instead, we, what, we, what we really talk about is like, okay, try to reduce your technology or security depth. Let, let's like debug your design. And these are the terms and the terminology that your, that your development teams and product owners are going to understand. So that's, that's really the lessons learned that I wanted to share uh, with you. So that instead of calling it threat modeling, sometimes you have to sweeten it up a little bit, uh, so to say, uh, to convince people uh, how to do this. That's, uh, that's our story of how we got into the threat modeling training. Um, so that's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Siva. All right, our next speaker, Tanya Janka. She hacks purple. Take it away. Hi, everyone. OK, so, so far, everyone's talked about how threat modeling is for everyone. So when I learned to threat model, I basically got to sit in on two threat models with someone else. And then they said, you're in charge now. Bye. <laughs> and I was taught that the technical people weren't invited. Yeah. <laughs> I was told the developers don't know anything. They can't come to the threat model. They won't have any good ideas. And so when I first did my first contract, I was like, I'm the boss now. I can decide. And I think the devs, so in my opinion, devs, they're all hackers. Just no one told them yet. They're like, I did a workaround. I'm like, no, that's called an exploit. <laughs> right? And so um, I invited two of them to a meeting. And I'm talking with the business people, and they're like, we're concerned about this, we're concerned about that. I'm like, cool. And I turn to them, I'm like, if you could hack your app, how would you do it? 
And you know what one of them said? He said, oh, well, there's that admin module. And I'm looking at the design document. It's not there. Apparently, once a month, they had to do some sort of administrative thing at midnight, and their boss wouldn't pay overtime. So they designed this admin module so they could do it from home. <laughs> and it was wildly insecure. It was this giant hole punched through the firewall. It was very, very bad. And I was like, thanks, guys. And we fixed it, right? And so that's one example of like why everyone needs to be involved so we hear everything. So I have one more story because we have limited time. This is what happens when you have six wordy people. Um, so the first time I went to AppSec Cali, um, I got to teach, which was really exciting for me. I was with my mentor at the time, Nicole Becker, and we taught about how to hack APIs. And um, it was super, super fun. And then after, I went and partied with my students, because that's what I'm like. Um, and we went out, we had drinks, we were hanging out. And then one of them was sitting there on his phone, kind of freaking out. And we ended up going back to his hotel, a bunch of us, to try to help him manage the security incident. So he had started a startup. And his startup helped people of a certain community, which I won't name, because it'll be really obvious who I'm talking about. And it's not a security community. Um, and they would basically help people find each other in the community. So it turned out, without logging in, you could put in anyone's email address, and then you could figure out physically where they would be in the world. <laughs> and I was like, ugh. Oh. That's not OK. And they're, all the men in the room were like, what do you mean? And the guy whose startup it was, he's like 6'2", six, 6'3", six, his shoulders are like this wide. And he's like, what do you mean? What's the problem with that? I'm like, well, no one messes with you. And I'm like, this is why diversity matters. Because to me, I think of, oh, like maybe someone's going to come beat me up that doesn't, you know, like maybe someone has a, an ex-partner that's abusive. Maybe they have a stalker. Maybe. And he's like, Oh, I never thought of that. And he's like, we don't need diversity. We already have it because I'm gay. And I'm like, no, diversity is not one person that's not like you don't add like a white lady to a panel and then you have diversity. Diversity is about having all sorts of different types of thoughts, all sorts of different types of backgrounds, all sorts of types of people. Right. And he was like, oh, I thought we'd check that box. And I was like, oh, and so like with threat modeling of every area of security, I feel threat modeling diversity matters the absolute most diversity of thought and experience and types of people and life situations you've had. And so I wanted to share that. And up next, we're going to have a video from Adam Shostak. And I'm really excited for his video. And for those of you that might be at his training later this week, I'll see you there. Thank you. I'm Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. So as Tanya mentioned, we have a special video to show you from someone who couldn't be here today. We're going to make sure this runs. I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person. I'm teaching in the other Washington and need to be there tomorrow night. But I will be in AppSec DC later this week. I want to share a little bit of my history in threat modeling. In 2006, I joined Microsoft and had to transition from threat modeling as an expert to empowering, encouraging, helping other people do that work. That changed everything for me, and it's a journey that's still going on. Before I talk about that, I want to acknowledge not only many great colleagues at Microsoft, but also the help of Window Snyder. As you may know, Window, along with Frank Swiderski, wrote the very first threat modeling book, and she also gave me a tremendous amount of her time and insight into the challenges that I was going to face in my new role, and I'm deeply appreciative. My first official task there was to fix threat modeling, and sometimes it feels like I haven't gotten that done. But you all are here making it more accessible, understandable, helping people, helping companies scale these amazingly valuable techniques. There are two big trends that I see dominating the future of threat modeling, and neither of them are large language models. Now, AI will influence, will accelerate these other trends, but I think it's less important 
than the two that I see. One major trend is the continued democratization of threat modeling. We want systems to be secure by design, and we need everyone to threat model every story. That means lightweight methods which are easy to teach and to use. The other major trend is the increase in liability and regulation. That will lead to a responsibility to threat model. It will also sometimes demand less lightweight methods for threat modeling. How are these going to interact? How can we make our work as impactful as possible for the energy that we devote to it? These, I think, are the big challenges, the big trends that will dominate the next five years. Well, I guess that's it. All right, so we had planned this, uh, this not a keynote keynote, um, like down to the minute, and we have about 20 minutes of extra time. So I'm gonna have the, re the group come up. Uh, well, actually, we're going to start with a little bit of Q&A. We weren't planning on doing Q&A, but it would be great if we can, uh, questions from the audience, to come on up. Uh, Izar has, uh, has one of these. If you want to talk, just uh, raise your hand. We'll come on up oh. to you. Are you okay? Yes. Uh, um, you can check the box of, uh, now you know. Don't you injure the speakers. The box of disabled. <laughs> Not every disability is obvious. Just remember that. So before we I was start, to catch you. <laughs> 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 that would be interesting. Uh, if before we get started with questions from the audience, I have a question I'd like to uh, to get from each of you. So now that you're here, and this is the first this is the first dedicated threat modeling conference, can you just give a couple minutes of sort of what does it mean for you, given your career, each of your careers, and given where you are where we are today in the world of threat modeling, what are your thoughts? It's a long time coming. That's my thought. I mean, Chris, uh, I don't know where you are in the room, Chris, uh, talked about him and Isar talking about this, but Isar and I have talked about this like 20 times, and I was hoping that the IEEE thing would get something like this going. Did not. It turned into experts, great experts. I mean, imagine writing a booklet in six weeks. That was those that 14 people, right? But still, it's a long time coming. I actually, to be honest, suggested this when I was on the steering committee for what works in security architecture for SANS in 2010. So a long time coming. Really happy you're here, really pleased, and I'm really excited about the birds of a feather, just to point out where we can actually sit down and talk problems. Thanks, Brooke. So, like I mentioned before, you know, kind of things have come to light. And seeing this conference actually happening is, is quite amazing. And it's just wonderful to see so many people that are doing it, that are learning how to do it, and getting involved with this. You know, so for me, when I made my transition, I was doing something before I didn't know, some, you know what it was. But now that it's become popular, you know, we're starting to see more people asking about this. Do you threat model? And to be here and to experience this with the workshops and everything that's going on is just fantastic. And I think overall, just the, the journey within threat modeling, how it's come to light, is really about uh, where, I, where I see that is. It's just another thing that we do, that we should do, that is part of something that, that we are already doing. And I think that it's really cool to see this come so far from when it started, you know, book, what, what year was it when it was kind of an official thing? Was it 84? No, but, um, or? Well, the Department of Energy was, like I said, Department of Energy was thinking about this, yeah. their first program. So anybody who thinks they invented the very first threat modeling program, no, it was invented at the US labs in 1984. <laughs> it was not an EAI, it was, you know, a rule-based system, but still, 1984, I saw the paper. Um, so yeah, 80s. In the 80s, to think about that, here we are in 2023. How long has it taken? Brooke, you mentioned like, wow, finally it's here. Yes. That's my entire 40 years in high tech. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a long time coming, so this is awesome. Yeah, I'm excited about having an 
conference devoted to threat modeling. I know about 10 years ago, I would look around and see if anybody was talking about threat modeling, and I would go to that conference, and I would say, that's the threat modeling conference, but it wasn't. That's how I met Brooke and, and several others over time. I would find out, where are they speaking? What are they talking about? Because no one else is really talking about this. Let me go to that conference. And for me, that was the threat modeling conference. But the reality is, we're finally here today. And it's exciting to see everybody here and, and to be together and see people in person uh, that sometimes we just interact with uh, online. Uh, it's just fantastic. And so that's, for me, it's just it's, it's great uh, to, to be a part of this and to see how it's come along over the last many, many years. Thank you. Some of it has been said already. It's, I was also looking forward to this. It's, it's great. It's great to see you all also in, uh, in real life. Instead of doing this uh, remotely, I think the doing threat modeling in real life is also the best way to do this. Um, so I'm actually looking forward to learn a lot uh, to, from, from you all. Um, and uh, yeah, very happy to be with you. I am so pumped. <laughs> Usually, like, when I go to a security conference, I'm like, oh, there's, like, three talks about AppSec. I'll see those. And the rest of the day, eh, I'll answer email. Um, I know I'm not supposed to admit that I find the other areas of security a little snooze fest, but I do. <laughs> and so I'm like, a conference all about threat modeling? Yes! Um, so I'm pretty excited to have, like, every single talk be something I want to see. And I'm excited that they're filming. Are they filming all of it or just some? We don't know. OK. <laughs> well. You rock, the guy that is filming this. Um, and so anyway, I'm really excited. I'm going to see as much as I can. Um, I feel like I'm hearing more and more about threat modeling, but I'm hoping after this that we hear a lot more, like a lot more. I'm hoping that it becomes the main stage and not the side stage. I'm hoping it becomes a core part of every AppSec program. So as um, so I started doing quite a bit of consulting. Well, I technically was consulting before, but just a little bit. But in 2018, I started doing stuff for IAN's research, meeting with different AppSec teams. So. It's actually been like over 300 teams I've met with. I thought it was 400, but it turned out I just met with a bunch of them two, three, four, five, six times, and I was over counting. But still, it's a lot of teams. And it used to be like, oh, we've heard of threat modeling, and now they're like, this year's the year. And so tons of teams are starting to do it, and so I'm seeing it picking up more and more. And so I'm hoping all of you will go and share what you learned with more people. And with that, I want to see what you have to ask, because we're here for you. Yeah, you. What do you, this is an open question for the panel, um, but you mentioned that inclusion is one of the things that's really important for threat modeling. Which group, and I'm using the term group very broad here, it can be business, it can be um, different people's representations. What group it is the least represented that we should be trying to enable and empower more uh, as we move forward? Ooh, oh, okay. Oh, I go? <laughs> Um, this might sound weird, but I find employees are the least ones, the people building the stuff. They don't ask them very often. <laughs> like they talk to the users and the business owner, and then they're like the person building it. They're like, shut up. Um, so that's my experience, because I was a dev for more of my life than security. But I want to hear everyone else's opinion. And, you know, others too, of course. But um, my friend Owen Carroll, who's a fabulous security architect, stuck up, he used to do the most detailed threat models you have ever seen in Visio with layers. And one day he just thought, I'm gonna put them in all the stand-up rooms. And something magical happened at that dev center that taught me a huge lesson. Because they had access to the threat model, every story, threat modeling every story, where was that? Coming off was they'd go up and say yeah not no security for this one oh yeah and you know what i think we're going to need a little security help with this okay that's one story that changed me i started teaching everyone and everyone in the room i cannot tell you how many times i have not counted them i have included everyone including the product managers absolutely anyone who's driving process whatever their job everyone and i train everyone literally I've been sitting in a threat model, and someone who has a real, oh, they wouldn't know anything about threat modeling, raises their hand and says, well, what about the default password on the open SSH port on the, need I say more? 
That was a real story, by the way. I never tell false stories. I always tell you the truth. And that's a real story, and that saved us real big embarrassment because that open SSH port that was just default and being used for debugging in the, in the operating system didn't go live. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah, that reminds me of a, a similar story in, in just being able to get this to everybody. Uh, when I was at the bank, we, you know, during the last few years when it was uh, not in person, it was all online, and we were having a threat modeling uh, training, and we're just trying to get some people interested. And I had a friend say, hey, I can just send it out to my um, user list, my uh, email list, uh, the invite. Oh, okay, sure, sounds good. How many are on that list? 6,000. <laughs> what? <laughs> so we had the training, and we had 600 people show up from everywhere, and we ran out of room. We couldn't. They, it was going to 1,000. We couldn't get that many in. And, and they were from everywhere, not just developers, not just architects or security people, but everywhere. Everyone was interested. What's this threat modeling? I've heard of it. Let me go check it out. So open it up. Open it up. Um, there are lots and lots of people that you might not even realize have an interest and certainly can, can get some value from it. Yeah, and I, and I can also share a similar kind of story. It's, it's indeed, it's, it's the, the people who actually build the stuff that, that needs to understand what can go wrong. And it's a little bit changing their mindset, not making them hackers, but understanding that there's something else than happy flows. Uh, and so that's, that's is if you can bring that to the table, uh, I have a story that we, we taught, for instance, a group of uh, engineers that were building a smart grid network. Uh, so they had absolutely no interest and in, in, in experience in security, uh, but we taught them how to do attack trees. Uh, in like less than an hour, we built an attack tree against their own smart grid network. And I can tell you, they had a lot of work afterwards. Um, so, but, but bringing that like technique, that methodology towards them will help them enormously because they already know really well where the issues are. They just ha don't have the opportunity to share that. And, that's, uh, and bringing that and, and activating that itself is, uh, is very valuable. I have a quick tip. No one asked, but I'm going to tell you. If you're trying to get buy-in from developers and other people in IT, do a threat model on the main part of your business. When I worked at elections, they did a threat model on voter suppression, the thing that Canada fears the most. And it opened every person's eyes. Everyone became more passionate and more cooperative with the security team. So whatever your main business thing is that everyone lives and breathes all day, do a threat model about that and show them how hard you protect that and everyone else will be on board a lot more from then on. I'd also love to hear other tips once we're done questions. Yeah. So maybe not so much of a direct question, but bouncing back on your previous uh, comment uh, of threat modeling becoming more on, you know, coming more to the main stage rather than being on site uh, stage. Um, I was at Kubicon uh, a couple of years ago, and they, they do have a security track now, and you know the container security space has come up. So why not threat modeling now? You know, like why don't we go into those mainstream conferences that are aimed at developers and introduce threat modeling there? So j you know, just an open question, comment. I mean, take it however you want, but that's how I would see it, kind of, you know, being broadened uh, out to to the wider audience. I'll answer that first. I, I still do that. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, my heart is development. I've been doing this for years, and so I try to at least two or three, if I can, uh, per year, hit a uh, developer conference and present threat modeling. I may be the only one doing it <laughs> and talking about security topics in some of them, but uh, and I and I have you know folks come in and say, oh, I wish we were doing this. I wish people talked about this a lot more. And so I agree, it's, uh, let's, let's break into some other folks, or other places rather, and talk to those folks about uh, security because sometimes we get in the conferences and we're just talking to each other. But let's, let's find some opportunities to talk to other folks as well. So I agree. Okay, I'm, I'm going to put John on the hard spot because oh, one way or another is gonna come to there. Right? <laughs> so support is good. Communication, collaboration is great, but eventually we all come to the money, right? Uh, and so it takes long. Uh, 2019, John was on my team, and we yep. tried to introduce 
threat modeling in a company. Finally, this year, we have some money for that. So it's a long process, but he has a cute story how we actually were able to convince not just one big business, but the business of the, the businesses of the business to actually get some money for, wow. for our initiative. I went to the bank, I borrowed a bunch, <laughs> and they gave me a check, and I sent the money to where it needed to go. No, actually, it's a really great kind of little bit of story I have here, and, and just really it was understanding benefits and it was really getting uh, buy-in from development and the solutions teams first, as opposed to cyber. Because really it was kind of uh, interesting that, <coughs> excuse me, um, when they began to realize things where they could save time and where they got to learn more and participate and become more involved and bridge the gap between development and security. You know, we launched a security champions program. We were having a great time with that. And really it was around that kind of support when you have your CTO that says, I want us to all do this. You know, we had a program happening where I work and it was around next gen cyber, kind of all, all these different stuff. And it just happened to be that I had enough support from the areas of business that would benefit the most to be able to say, hey, yes, we want to do this. So to get that money, one of the other things that we did is they had a program going on within their group and solutions that I was able to get involved with early on that was the element of cyber information security that was part of that program. So we kind of got on the coattails of another program that we could better support. So by that, just with that alone, integrating more into development and being a partner and not the police, that's what got us the ability to have a team. So I built a team. We have you know, tools that we use. We have those kinds of things as well. And that was really kind of the big buy-in. So the executives were, oh yeah, you guys want to really do this. Is it helpful? Perfect. Let's go. So. Can I add something? Yeah. Sometimes you just got to do it. I can't tell you how many industry panels or other things I've been on where the people who work in large companies say, well, you need, first thing you do is get executive buy-in and you write a strategy paper and stuff. I, I'm, you need executive buy-in, but sometimes the way you get it is not by doing that. When you have a lot of resistance, has anybody experienced the, that's a great idea, we're not ready. And that goes on for like three years. It's a great idea, but not now, not now. Three months, no, six months. Then it becomes a year, and it becomes a year and a half, and it, you know. Sometimes you just got to do it. And the value is so obvious that it becomes a grassroots movement. Ditto. Like it's kind of one of the approaches I took, grassroots. So um, obviously AI is the big thing nowadays. How do you see AI positively influencing threat modeling? You want, you want to tell you? All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I just gave an AI talk four times at different conferences. So I had to do a lot of research. Um, uh, the thing is, AI is really good. Let's get really clear about where the state of the art is. We're not there to super intelligence, okay? Despite all the people punditing my opinion, and I'm at odds with Mr. Nadella at the head of Microsoft on this. He may be privy stuff I'm not privy to. But as far as I know, we're not anywhere near. It's very good at repeating a job it's learned how to do. I don't know that anybody's taught it how to do threat modeling. If we gave it a bunch of patterns, though, it'd be really good to be able to say, oh, this is that pattern. And that's you know a great way to do a threat modeling anyway. So just be really clear about what it's good. If we could train one to do patterns and to recognize patterns in flows or reading the code like Bionic does, I don't want to name a company, but they've got this really cool technology, I think, that reads the code and then fills, gets the flows and stuff, which is why they just got bought. Um, you know, something like that. And then we have the real flows or any of those things like Amazon X-Ray or whatever, and we could feed that into a model and it knew how to apply a bunch of other stuff. That would be great. I think that could take us a long way, but don't expect it to be John Taylor. No, I, I'm, I'm by no means an expert in that, that area, but I do see use cases, right? A lot of times we struggle with there's too many threats. There's too much to deal with. 
how do we leverage something that can have a level of intelligence to help us get through that? You know, that's one of the big challenges I see. It's like, oh, I run a threat model. All of a sudden, I got 100 different things that I got to think about. Well, I, I really can't deal with 100 things, right? So I got I to find the top things to deal with. And I think that that's probably something for those that don't have as much cyber experience can actually utilize to say, oh, you're telling me I should focus on these five or 10 things, because I don't want to give you 30. It's like I do an app scan. All of a sudden, you've got 30 findings to go deal with. 30? Uh, well, well, no, I'm just being... 72,000, that's a real number. Um, I don't want to count how many you know vulnerabilities I've seen over products over my life. Uh, but I think it is useful for an end user, those that have to deal with something that they don't understand on what to do. So to simplify it, I don't know if anybody else had a comment. Yeah, it's, uh, I just came up with, with uh, I think the best Turing, Turing test for an AI threat modeler is if it would be able to threat model our, all our legacy systems, uh, because that's where the big elephant in the room is. Uh, so nobody wants to do that, so let's give that to, uh, yeah, okay. And there's no vulnerabilities in those, right? Oh, no, 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 none, none, none. <laughs> He said, yeah. okay. Like There's somebody waving. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so far, so good. Thank you. This has been already worth the price of admission to come in just hear these so far. So very, very good. Uh, I have one of those legendary two-part questions. So number one, uh, if I wanted to roll this out at an enterprise scale, so let's say a very large organization, 200,000, 300,000 folks, what can... If there's a central security team, let's say head of security, CISO, and so forth, what can that team do to support this rollout, right? So I heard grassroots and so forth, but you're going to get inconsistency. So if we want consistency, would it be, you know, and, and, and a kind of sub point to that would be what are the prerequisite knowledge that would need to be there, right? Do we need to train folks on threats? Do we have to train folks on vulnerabilities, on you know, what is, what would be that ground level knowledge that would need to be there? That's part one of the question. Part two is a little bit polemic. What would you say to the doubting Thomases or the doubters that say, eh, threat modeling, nice to have, but it's not really key part. What would you, okay. what would you say to those folks? Those are my two, uh, two questions. Okay, so I'm gonna start with part one and say secure, creating a security champions program. So whenever I get to a, a really big company, so if, if there's only 50 devs, you can know all their names, but if there's 2,000, you just cannot, right? And so a Security Champions program, which I go on about constantly, and so does Chris, and I suspect some of you do too, um, basically you have one dev per team, and that's your champ. You teach them all the things. You teach them the threat modeling. And so you bring them along on sessions and teach them, and then eventually they can lead. That's the idea. So they do the security work for their team. And part two is for Brooke. No, no, I, I wasn't. Oh, oh, okay. I thought you were saying, like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, yeah. So, um, so I talk about this constantly, and that that's one of the only ways we can scale application security because you just can't hire enough AppSec engineers to work with 2,000, 5,000, 20,000 devs. So, some companies I work with, they're like, our security team's 22 people, and like only seven work on AppSec. And I'm like, oh, do they cry all day? <laughs> Why are you so cruel to these nice AppSec folks? And so by making a champions program, like so each person's capable of knowing around like 150 people maximum, and then you've got like your family, your friends, and people like that. So 40, 50 champions at is absolute maximum per professional. But 20 or 30 is like sweet spot. Um, I write lots of blogs and have a conference talk and papers about this because I'm obsessed, but there's like a lot of people that talk about like how to form a really good program. And you can have like a tight hold program, like the people from Hello Secure talk about, where it's like you meet with them one on one every month, you know everyone's name, you like they know your face, you come to their desk, and then there's like higher level ones where if you need to spread to more people and you just do the best you can and it's imperfect. But for me, that's the way that I scale security. I find you can't do it, uh, like you can't hire 47 AppSec people unless you're like Microsoft or Amazon. Sorry, Tanya, I didn't yeah. mean to, yeah, yeah. no, yeah. Um, what she said. Um, 
about the doubting, doubting Thomases. I mean, I can't add anything to that. It's exactly right. Yeah, that's how I do it. Just, yeah. Um, but ignore them. Um, seriously. <laughs> seriously. What I discovered very early as I became Cisco InfoSec's very first application security architect way back when was that I didn't need, the, the tipping point is not a majority. It's not even half. In a team of 15 people, if I can get two people to be interested in security, everyone starts paying attention. And I just ignore the Doubting Thomases if they insist upon looking at the news or their email while we're talking. I don't need them. Um, I ignore them. Um, you're always going to have someone who says, nah, maybe they're, they're a troll and they enjoy being against the grain or whatever. I don't, I don't have time for that. I really don't. And if I can get a couple of people, which is why I never refuse help from anyone. I find a place, the person's been there for three days and they say, I want to learn something about this security, secure design stuff. I find a place for them because they help my tipping point. That makes it just what we do. Yes, okay, it's on a slide. So is there a short, like, three, four sentence, 30 second elevator pitch for threat modeling that you can deliver um, in a concise manner? Because that's about all I have for a lot of people. Yeah, do we do this all together or? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great point, the 30 second elevator pitch. So. Uh, basically what I always hear, and there's a big question that I always get asked, and this is what kind of led me to what I'm going to say, is I don't have time, this is a new process, I can't do this. So my approach you know, for this is that basically what if I can have this process already embedded to the existing process that you do, that the results give you a more secure product, your teams that are creating products, will be more security minded, and I can save you time, I save you money. And that money can be exponential based on what you work on as a result to later, finding things down and the security findings. You're gonna have to spend how much time fixing bugs as a result of the things that you didn't think about beforehand. What if I could help you make your release happen quicker? What if I could slow down and not, or not slow down, but to speed up the whole process for you? And then, and then during that time, security does not become a bolt-on process or a thing on top of it. I want to build this program to what you already do. One other thing you could do is just be sneaky and just tell them you're doing an architecture review and then threat model. Tell them you're doing a pen test and then threat model. I did that a lot as a consultant. I'd be like, I'm going to do a pen test, and then I do AppSec at them. And I'm just like, tough shit. <laughs> so that's an option, too. Uh, Bhargava Gordi from Columbia University. Thank you all. You've done a great job, and thanks for helping us and becoming more better threat modelers. My question is, most of the time, what I've seen personally is the time to market window of an any application is very short. And we come up and say, hey, you got to do the threat modeling, you got to do this, and you got to fix the bugs. The manager doesn't want to do it because his head is on the line. Because if he doesn't go live, business will kick his butt. And the developers, they said, I do what my manager says. So how do you deal with that kind of a situation when the window is small and you got to provide a secure, and a good code. First, I take all the blame, and I'm never afraid to get fired for telling the truth. <laughs> I mean, seriously. But that's partly because I'm going to be 73 in two years. I'm done building my career. You probably are not that l lucky, or lucky to be alive this long, or OK, boomer, shut up. Um, <laughs> take your pick, right? But seriously, uh, I, I just, you know, I, I, I have enough now moxie to look at someone and say, no, this is important and we're going to do it. And I'm going to go up above you. And, and you know, that's where the exec buy-in really pays off. And I'll tell you one other thing very quickly here. 
if you find, this is where you find whether you really have exec support when it really matters and there are resources on the line. So it's okay with me if an exec doesn't agree with me and they're doing their job. I figure that's they're doing their job. They have to hold the risks, right? But if they listen carefully and make an informed decision, that's support, right? Because maybe sometimes you don't have time and that's okay. But most of the time, we're doing the right thing, right? Because we plan it out. That's when you find out. And if you don't have exec support, my advice, unsolicited, just like Tanya said, is find another job. <laughs> Ditto. All right, so let's give these folks one more big round of applause for sharing their expertise. And we've got right around 10 minutes, and then the next talks will begin. There'll be one talk in here and one in the Catholic University right next door. Check the agenda to see. We'll see you back in 10.